we start by writing actually some uh, 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 from yesterday, some notation that we saw yesterday, just to have it at the board. So yesterday we encountered Rosevich induction, if you hadn't encountered it before. So uh, the notation that we have, we have a sequence of shrinking intervals and uh, induced maps which are all interval exchanges of the same number of intervals. And uh, let me recall you that for uh, each of these maps, we can build the Rocklin towers. And uh, our notation was that uh, uh, R and J is the height of the J's tower. And uh, lambda and J is the Lebesgue measure of the J's tower at step N. And uh, uh, very important quantity, we had the uh, Rosevich cycle. So A n i j, where uh, the cardinality of visits of i n j to i zero i up to under t up to uh, r n j. So. This is a tool we said for impose the Yoffentan conditions on uh, uh, interval exchanges. And uh, these matrices are a product of d by d matrices. And uh, uh, you should think of each of these EI as a somehow multidimensional entry of a continued fraction map. So they are really generalization of the entries of the Gauss continued fraction algorithm. And maybe something which I didn't say yesterday, I can also say that you can think of An as A0 of Rn of t. So there is a renormalization map uh, which uh, takes the it and uh, looked at the, uh, the nth iterate of this renormalization is the nth induced map, but rescaled. So when I induce, I'm looking at smaller and smaller scales. But if I risk, I can always divide by the length of the interval so that I go back to unit length. And this induced IT rescaled is uh, giving me a renormalization operator. So renormalization is some zooming in and rescaling. So you can think of these matrices as a cocycle. Cocycle, so it's actually the Rosevich. And actually, we were doing acceleration of Rosevich cycle uh, on the space of ITs. And so these matrices somehow are produced in a deterministic fashion by the renormalization dynamics. And this is the part that we are skipping in this course. And of course, you can study this renormalization and the properties of this cycle. This is kind of dynamics in parameter spaces. And that's how you prove full measure of the Yoffentan conditions come from the study of this renormalization. I'm just kind of using the renormalization as a tool to study Birkhoff sums and not studying the dynamics of the renormalization in itself. OK, so then yesterday we spent the last hour a little bit in a, uh, uh, in a hurry, but we had, I hope I gave you an overview of how you prove uh, mixing estimates and stretching of Birkhoff sums in the asymmetric case. So today I want to do the other part of the game for the first hour. So I want to study absence of mixing. Okay. So we already stated yesterday the criterion. So I want to recall you. So recall. So we will put ourselves, sorry, in the, I will get there in a second, but I will go in the symmetric case, where my roof has symmetric singularities, and we want to uh, uh, prove absence of mixing for typical ITs. And the criterion uh, of kocher uh, used several times after him. So it's the following. So we had uh, EN, RN, where this uh, partial rigidity sets. So, which means that uh, uh, the measure of the sets is bounded below uniformly. 
in n. And uh, in some proper sense, uh, Rn is uh, a time where uh, along this set, the map is approaching identity. So this is what we call rigidity. So if it was on the whole space, we will say that the map is rigid. We don't have rigidity. So actually, for almost every IT, you also have rigidity. But uh, we don't want to uh, use full rigidity. We just need to use partial rigidity. So uh, to a positive part of time where the iterate of your map looks like identity. Uh, partial rigidity plus the following bound. Along this rigidity, you want to have no stretch. So there is a uniform constant such that uh, for every x and y in En, when I look at the corresponding rigidity time, my Birkhoff sums don't vary too much. And this implies no mixing. Okay. So I want to verify this. I want to use this criterion. So I need two things. I need to produce partial rigidity sets. And I need to prove bounds on Birkhoff sums, on no, no stretching bounds. Okay, Partial rigidity, and this is what I call no stretching. No stretching, no shearing. Maybe I should write it, no shearing, you see. Uh, maybe let me write it in shearing. Not shearing along this partial rigidity. So x and y, their orbits don't vary too much. I don't see this uh, growing discrepancy, which gives me shear. OK, so the first part. So first, I want to build the partial rigidity sets and show them where they lie. And this is really. It's uh, written in my words, but because uh, but it's, it's actually Katok. So Katok didn't use Rosevich induction, but essentially it's uh, his argument. Just I'm going to present it with the towers of Rosevich induction. Okay. So it's Katok. Uh, it's his paper in the 80s where he proves that no IT is mixing. Okay. Uh, okay. So let me also recall you. OK, maybe it's not so important now. Good. So let me show you what are the sets in the towers. So now we see whether we understand well our towers picture. So this is where the tower dynamic is in, useful. Uh, so we have these towers. So first of all, I'm going to pick, so for every L, I'm going to pick. Uh, say that we pick the largest tower. So pick J such that uh, uh, what is the area? R and J H, uh, sorry, R and J lambda and J is greater than 1 over D. So there are D towers, one will be the largest. If the step is balanced, you could take any of them and they will all have. Uh, fixed bounded, the area will be bounded below by 1 over d. But the, I'm also telling you a talk argument. I want to show you that here I'm not using anything spe special. Any IT could uh, work here. OK, now we look at, uh, we have the, say that this is my uh, largest. I don't know what is in my picture largest. <laughs> let's, let's say that this is the largest. OK, so this is my j. And now I induce induced map on, uh, if I induce on the base of this tower, so I take, uh, maybe like, at a, let me get the color. I take this interval. It's a small interval. And I look at the Poincare, uh, uh, the first return map to this uh, interval. We said yesterday, any induced map of the IET is an IET uh, uh, of at most d plus 2 intervals. Okay. So, so the induced IT is again uh, has d plus 2. So there exists, uh, let me call it uh, J continuity interval. Continuity interval for this induced map. Uh, 
uh, such that uh, uh, the area of j is at most, uh, at least, uh, 1 over d plus 2, the length. Right? I divide in d plus 2, was j, yes. Uh, sorry, maybe I, I was using the notation uh, lambda for the length. <coughs> okay? So I'm inducing, and I just pick the largest. Say I just pick the largest of this interval, say this one. And now I uh, will build a tower over this. Here, right? So this tower, I claim, will be my partial rigidity set. And I will show you. OK. Uh, and let me also call let Rn be the return time, first return time, of j to uh, i and j. So I have an induced map. So this interval comes with the return time uh, to the base. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so now I can set the n to be, we said, the tower over Rj. So this is the union of Ti of J uh, for i from 0 to the height i and j. Okay, this is a uh, uh, minus one. It's the height of the tower. So this is the blue set. <coughs> and I claim, so claim EN, RN are partial rigidity pairs. OK, so the area I chose it to be big. So the, what is the Lebesgue measure? It's uh, 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 it's uh, R and J times uh, Lebesgue measure of J. I sorry, I'm sometimes switching between notation. I was sometimes I use Lebesgue, sometimes I use uh, absolute value for Lebesgue. So what is the measure? Is uh, 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 this is one over d plus two R and J lambda and J. And J was chosen so that this area is at least, uh, so I'm using this one and this one. And they give me 1 over D, D plus 2. So the area has a lower bound. And now I claim that, uh, so T Rn of the base is back in the larger T O N. Trn of j by definition is back to the base. So when I look at this return time, it will maybe go many times around, but this small interval will be back to, uh, maybe I will plot it in a different color. It will be back, uh, uh, I don't know, somewhere here. Maybe it overlaps, maybe it doesn't, doesn't matter, in the same base. Okay? So these two intervals are certainly close. But I claim, look at the picture, please. <laughs> It say that I take some other interval in the middle or some part of the tower. So what will it do? It will go up, it will come back on the red, and then it will remount the tower up to the same level. So each uh, interval will go back and come back up to the same height, okay, by construction. So what I claim is that this implies that uh, for every Ti of j in En for every uh, ice floor, uh, Trn plus i of j is uh, contained in Ti of i and j. Okay? And uh, So every floor of the tower comes back at this in the same floor of the bigger tower. And the towers are shrinking to zero, so this is rigidity. But uh, uh, the size of i n j is going to zero, and this implies uh, uh, rigidity. Okay. 
So it's coming back very close to itself. Fine? Um, so this is, by the way, uh, really a uh, remark. So Katok, uh, uh, Katok uh, uh, some version of Katok proof, Katok argument, uh, for Katok argument, you actually we can prove something a little bit more. So basically what we proved, uh, uh, basically along the same line, uh, we can prove that there exists a partition. This is just uh, Ernst Tower, Ernst Tower's floors. So I did this only for uh, this tower, but without a lower bound on the area, I can do the same argument for the other towers. And I can find partitions, and there exist finitely many, finitely many, so at most, uh, let's see, d times d plus 2, return times. Uh, rigidity times for floors for uh, par this partition element. So I can basically look at the full partition. Each tower I can divide into d plus 2 uh, induced towers. And uh, each of these uh, towers will have a unique uh, rigidity time. So there will be one time where every floor simultaneously come back near itself. So with this, this is uh, maybe you can, if you want, you can, I'm not going to do the details, but uh, this implies that T is not mixing. So if I give you some measure, some set A, first of all, I can approximate it with uh, with uh, fl fl floors of towers. So I can believe that my set is almost union of floors. And then there are finitely many times for which this set. Uh, uh, so there will be at least one of these times which will pick a significant proportion of A. So there will be a significant proportion of A which will come back very close to itself. But if a set has too much self-intersection, it cannot mix. So you can make the epsilon and delta proof. But essentially, if the set is small enough and the A intersected, some return time of A is greater than a constant times the measure of A, it cannot be of order mu A squared. It cannot be what it should be by mixing. So you can work it out, but this is essentially the full, it's close to be the full proof of absence of mixing for any IT. And actually, that's to advertise. So I taught in a summer school this summer at ICTP. Uh, David and Irene were TA in the school. There are lectures online on YouTube for the summer school. So I think in the very last lecture, I was doing Rosevich induction, and I did this proof uh, with also the last part. So you can also watch <laughs> the last lecture of the ICTP summer school. OK, <coughs> good. So we, uh, good here. So we have rigidity sets. So now it's time to do. Time to do, um, maybe I leave the uh, rigidity sets are, uh, where are they? OK, maybe I'll just rewrite this EN qui. Ah, no, they do not have everything here. OK, it doesn't matter. I think you, I leave the, pic the picture is there. So we'll just keep this picture and erase the board. Sorry, I cannot find, uh, anybody knows where the, <laughs> eraser. Huh? Should it be? Ah, sorry. Thank <laughs> you so much. Good to see you. Okay. So now, uh, balance. Uh, sorry, cancellations. So now I want to prove um, the following proposition. So. Okay, I prepare my notes, but then I don't use them, so maybe I should sometimes, so that I'm sure that I don't forget what I want to tell you. Yeah, it's okay. Now I want to prove uh, the second part, the second ingredient that I need. So I will write it as a proposition. So for almost every IT, there exists a sequence uh, 
uh, and k tending to plus infinity of uh, 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 balanced, positive and balanced uh, induction time. Ah, sorry. Uh, Okay, maybe that's fine. I will keep. I write it in generality. Uh, uh, okay, so we already have our function with symmetric log, and I'm going to study the derivative. Right? Remember, yesterday we studied the derivative and proved that it grows faster than uh, an L1 function. It was growing like uh, r log r, the r sphere for some. And now I want to basically prove that. Uh, uh, I will do a, uh, such that, so for every uh, x in the base, uh, I'm going to look at the Birkhoff sums up to the height of the tower. So for every 0 less than r uh, less than r and j. So I'm looking at the Birkhoff sum from the base up to something less than the height. And this is the step uh, nk of the induction. And this is any, actually, sorry, uh, for every j and for every x in ij. So for all points in the base, if I look up to the height of the corresponding tower, I want to prove the following bound. S, uh, so this is the. Ah, no, actually, let me write it like this. This is the Birkhoff sum of the derivative at x. Uh, oh, and I can claim that uh, sometimes. Uh, and maybe I should say here there exists an m uniform. And uh, sorry, maybe let me make a, a simplifying assumption. Sorry, I should have done this uh, earlier. Uh, uh, okay, let me just write. Sorry, uh, can I, uh, what can I write? Uh, let me write here. So I'm going to assume I should have done it before the proposition. So I could write the general formula, but for the whole purpose of today, let me assume that the function is simply one, uh, uh, it has one, well, two singularities. It has one over, uh, the function is log x plus uh, log of one minus x, right? So the function is uh, symmetric log. Otherwise, I complicate my notation for nothing. So this is my function. Yesterday also, we just did one-sided, and now today we do the symmetric pair. And uh, so, F prime is simply 1 over, OK, uh, maybe with a minus, OK. <laughs> OK, <laughs> 1 over x minus 1, 1 minus x, something. So uh, OK, so that's the type of function we are studying. And probably I want it negative. So maybe it's with a minus. Uh, minus. OK, so yesterday we saw that for one side it's log. This was growing like r log r. Here we want to say that uh, for the special subsequence of times, I can bound it with uniform constant times r, like it were integrable. So then, of course, as we learned yesterday, I have no hope to control the closest points. So I need to add, uh, let me write it here, what are x0 and y0. So x0 is just the closest point uh, to 0. It's the minimum of uh, okay, these distances, if you want, which is just x in my case. I'm just calling it x0 for uh, symmetry. So this is the closest point to the origin along my tower. And uh, y0 is the closest point uh, to, the, to 1. So this is the minimum of closest point to 1. So the minimum minimizes 1 minus ti of x over the orbit. OK? So closest, closest visit to 0. And this is the closest visit to 1. 
So these two, I need to uh, trim them somehow. I to, if I want to control my Birkhoff sums, this can always spoil the behavior. But uh, uh, we will see that we can also uh, bound them in a second. We will bound them too. But I want to emphasize that these two can be arbitrarily close, but everything else has uh, a behavior which is uh, much tamer than the uh, R log R we saw yesterday. Okay? So let me try to convince you that uh, this is sufficient. So I will, I will tell you how, why this is the case and how you can prove this. But before doing that, I want to convince you that if we have that, we have uh, no stretch. Uh, we have this uh, uh, second part of the criterion. Okay. So, so again, this is an estimate on Birkhoff sums. It's not for every time. It's only for a special subsequence of time, which we will have to choose carefully. And uh, the derivative, essentially, uh, even though the function has this one over x singularities, and yesterday we saw that if there was only one of them, it would grow like r log r. When there are two, there would be some cancellation effect between positive and negative parts. And this log r will disappear. And remember, yesterday it's really the log r which was giving the stretch. So this will be the no stretch. And now let me show you how uh, proposition uh, plus rigidity sets implies uh, no mixing. So let me conclude the argument assuming the proposition. So I will write it a little quickly because it's not my. So So take the rigidity set. So take uh, mk as in the proposition, and take emk uh, uh, corresponding rigidity, partial rigidity. So I will look inside my set, and I need to prove that uh, the Birkhoff sums uh, for any two points in this set, the, the difference of the Birkhoff sum is bounded. Uh, okay, so this is my blue partial rigidity set. Yeah. First of all, I want to make sure that also I want to control x0 and y0. So I don't want uh, uh, to go too close to the singularity. So the first thing you can do, you can trim. Let me write it like this. I will show you. You can trim A and K uh, to control x0 and y0. I.e., what I want to do is just uh, remove from my set some kind of pillow. I want to remove uh, the right side and the left side. S and I will now I look at a smaller set where I tr trim the boundary. So this will be A and K prime. Yeah, uh, consider A and K prime uh, uh, obtained uh, where uh, a proportion c over the sorry c over what is the height uh, c over r and j uh, 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 proportion was removed on both sides. Let me not be write it too formally. It's missing. And here I'm using balance using uh, balance is used here. Now I will explain. So sorry. So this height is R and J. And uh, by balance, uh, 
balance, you see all towers have comparable ratio. So the width is also size something like of order constant times uh, R and J. So if the tower is balanced, the heights and the lengths are, have all uh, similar ratio. So I have enough room to remove two pillows, to remove something which is, uh, uh, sorry, this uh, maybe it's a different constant. So it's some, so there is some constant, and then I can find a smaller constant which can fit. Uh, I don't know. This could be. This is related to nu to the balance and the number of intervals. And this would be a smaller constant. But I can remove something which is proportional to the height from the right and to the left. Uh, this will imply that. Uh, uh, this will imply that. Uh, uh, this will imply a control on x0, y0, which will be greater than something like uh, uh, 1 over constant r and j. So there will be some, uh, no, sorry, uh, not, uh, the opposite. sorry, constant. The points cannot go too close, neither to 0 nor to 1. So what happens? So this somehow uh, these uh, floors are all disjoint. It's a partition, right? So wherever they are in 0, 1, I have this little pillow which protects me from 0, and that little pillow that protects me from 1. OK? So I'm just uh, removing the closest points. Uh, I think I can erase this. And now. Uh, Now, basically, maybe I should write one keyword. The keyword is uh, uh, keyword is uh, mean value. So now I want to compare. Uh, maybe this is a zoomed-in version of EK prime. Let me write it like this. Uh, maybe not. Okay, let's write it like this. Uh, this is my EK prime. So I need to compare points in EK prime. So and I need to study uh, uh, comparison. And basically, I can do two cases. It's enough that I compare x and y in the base, and then I compare y above x. So if I can compare any two points in the base and any two points on top of each other. I can control any two points. And uh, so first, let's say, what is uh, S uh, uh, Rn of f of x minus S Rn uh, uh, f of y? Uh, uh, no, Sr, sorry. This is R, not Rn. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's just mean value. So here I will compare. Uh, I will have something which is like uh, m. Then the two endpoints will be like something like 2 over c, because I control them. Uh, this is the bound for the derivative. So here I'm using the bound for. Uh, here I have continuity within this set. So by, um, maybe I should have not one more step, sorry. So this will be less than uh, if x and y are both in the base, both in the base. If they're both in the base, you see immediately that I can just do mean value. So this is just the derivative at some point in the middle times uh, the size of the interval. And this is less than. Uh, by the proposition is less than const, uh, sorry, m plus uh, 2c. Uh, this is the control of x0 and y0 times Rn. And the size by balance is, again, something like uh, uh, some constant over Rnj. So this is a, a m prime, some big constant. Okay, So it's the right order. The derivative is of order, uh, uh, is at most uh, uh, Rn, and the base is 1 over Rn. And uh, 
The other case, it's, uh, we have to look a little bit in the tower. I think I'm spending too much time on this. Uh, look at it. Uh, what if x and y uh, are above each other? So what do I have to compare? Maybe I need two colors. If x and y are above to each other, I'm comparing the Birkhoff sign for x, which is something like this. And the Birkhoff sum for y, what would be the Birkhoff sum for y? It will be uh, start from y, go to the top, and then it will come back somewhere in the base and go up to the same height. Right? This is the Birkhoff sum of y. So they have one piece in common, and the difference is again some Birkhoff sum from the base to some height. Okay? So. Maybe I'll just look this color. So similar, uh, similar for y above x. See picture. So again, the difference you will do it by mean value. So I have to compare the red, this part of the red with this part of the yellow, and I do mean value, and I use the, the derivative up to the sum of the derivative up to this height. But an important point which uh, I really need, I, I cannot allow myself to do only the Birkhoff sum of the derivative up to the full tower. So if I want to do the full tower, uh, um, so I, I, I really need this intermediate kind of uh, uh, times. Okay. Uh, okay. So now uh, what do we do? Now I want, oh, I erased the proposition I want to prove. This was a mistake. Uh, uh, OK, maybe I'm too late. <laughs> I already erased. So now I want to prove the estimates on the derivatives. OK, so I want to give you the heuristic argument, or why, or what do you want to prove to show cancellations. So we need somehow some finer understanding of equidistribution of the orbit points to get uh, 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 this no shearing estimates. Okay. So what I will do now is maybe to uh, give you an heuristic. So we started yesterday for the asymmetric log with, with a heuristic. We saw where the log r comes from. Lying and imagining that all points are equidistributed are maybe great space. So let me say heuristic for cancellations. I call them cancellations because uh, uh, maybe I should write heuristic for no shearing. And no shearing come comes from uh, cancellations between the positive and the negative part. So let me recall you. Uh, maybe I will call it, uh, OK, f prime. I don't know if it's, but okay, let me call it just g is 1 over x minus 1 minus x. It's minus f prime. And uh, again, it's uh, the main po part is that it's uh, not L1, but uh, something like the principal value of g is equal to 0. So the reason why it doesn't, why it's not L1 uh, is actually, so there is a positive explosion like 1 over x and a negative explosion like 1 over x, and uh, they are of the same order. So if, for example, I look at the integral from epsilon to 1 minus epsilon symmetrically of g, this will be 0. OK, so there are cancellations between the two parts. And that's what we need to exploit. I want to exploit cancellation between these two parts. And to exploit this cancellation, I need to know that my sequence is pretty well distributed. So if my sequence was indeed an arithmetic progression, uh, it would be perfectly balanced. But my sequence will deviate from an arithmetic progression. And I need to control it quite finely to exploit cancellations. Okay. So what we are going to do, maybe I'll give you the, the uh, key idea. 
first point is, uh, uh, let me introduce some notation. So I have my orbit. So I'm going to look, actually, maybe I should say. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to prove, want to prove, uh, I'll just rewrite this, SR f prime of x uh, less than constant plus 1 over x0 plus 1 over s, sy. And again, like yesterday, there are two steps. So step one will be to consider uh, the full height, to consider kind of, uh, 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 consider uh, r equal to the full height. So this is like a special bit of some case. So I will need it for intermediate times, but I first prove it for the full tower. And I will only tell you this. So I want to uh, consider a bit of some of the derivative for the full tower. And the step two, like yesterday, it will be a decomposition. Decomposition into special Birkhoff sums. for other r. So if I have an intermediate r, I don't know, up to here, I will use full towers of the previous steps to approximate it. So if I have a full r, you know, I can maybe decompose it into a number of full towers of a lower time, and then I can interpolate with the other full towers of a smaller time, and so on, and so on, and so on. So I can approximate another r with previous time. There is some tricky part here, too, but I also don't want to. I think I'm happy if I can show you what do you do for a special Birkhoff sum for the full height. OK? OK. So now I'm going to take uh, 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 the full orbit. So take x in the base, and r will be the full height. R and J. Uh, so this is somehow the better distributed picture. So I have my point, and I look at the orbit. So the orbit will go around somewhere. But I let me, for convenience of notation, I'm interested in closest comparing closest visits to the right with closest visits to the left. So let me relabel the points, ordering them by distance. So, uh, so we are considering x dot 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 up to tr minus 1 of x. Relabel, relabel points. Uh, Relabel points. And let me say let. So x was x0 less than x1, la 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 la, xi. Let xi uh, be uh, such that uh, xi is the ice distance from 0. So this is x0, this is x1, this is x2, x3, and so on. So xi now are the distances from 0 in increasing order. OK? And let, uh, let me call y0 less than y1, yi. OK, it goes to yr minus 1 and to xr minus 1. So I'm not going to label the points, but I'm going to label the distances. So y1 will be the closing distance from 1, y2, y0, y1. So yi is the ice distance from 1 in increasing order. So it's the distance of the ice closest point to 1. OK? 
Okay, so just a lot. Is it clear the definition? Or sorry, at these points, I basically, basically, if you want, I look at my orbit and I order it from left to right, and then I look at one minus my points and I order them from right to left. So somehow I want to cancellate uh, ice point with ice point. So and. Uh, Again, if everything was perfectly arithmetic, they would perfectly cancel. But uh, you need to allow, of course, for some discrepancy. So I'll tell you what we one shows. So if, let me show you claim. So. Uh, OK, actually, maybe more than claim. So we'll show something like this. We'll show that xi uh, doesn't vary too much from an arithmetic progression. So we will show if everything was arithmetic, xi would be i 1 over r. There are r points. If everything has equal distance, xi would be 1 over i. So it's arithmetic plus, and let me write it like this, some epsilon i over r, some error from arithmetic. And I have to tell you something about this error. And uh, uh, similarly from uh, uh, yi plus, uh, OK, I should use a different notation, some epsilon tilde over r, so where and what I will show about these errors, what is key, is the following, that if I sum, uh, uh, sorry, uh, this could be positive or negative, so I guess I need to put uh, uh, absolute value. So, and if I sum them with respect to i squared, this will be less than a finite, uh, a finite sum, <coughs> uniformly in, in uh, in the induction step. So we will show this, and I claim that I will show you, I claim that this is sufficient. Claim this is enough to prove the proposition, to prove step one, step two are willing to. So the statement I hope is clear. So I'm doing looking at the discrepancy from arithmetic, and I want to have some form of bound. Let me convince you why this is a good bound. So proof of the claim. So I want to look at uh, S uh, R G of X. G is my uh, minus the derivative is my function. So what is this Birkhoff sum? This is the sum from zero to R minus one of 1 over ti of x minus 1 over 1 minus ti of x. And up to rearranging it. So this is just definition of Birkhoff sum. And this is just the sum of 1 over xi minus 1 over yi, right? I'm just uh, uh, reordering these elements and reordering these elements with my notation. And now let's keep aside, keep aside 1 over x0 and 1 over y0. I can keep them aside because they are aside in my result I want to prove. So I just need to worry from, uh, for the others. The first and the last, I cannot hope to compensate them. So it could happen that the first is skewed to the right, or the skewed the last. Uh, uh, and then you will not have a bound unless you throw these points away. And then, so what I'm estimating, I want to estimate the sum from one 
to r minus 1 or 1 over xi minus 1 over yi. And I put that common denominator, xi minus yi, xi, yi. Okay. Just put the common denominator. <coughs> OK. Uh, should I call this a star? So I want to use, uh, uh, I want to use this uh, claim of the arithmetic. So if they, they are both close to arithmetic, the main order cancels. So when I look at the difference, i over r cancels. So here I have uh, uh, epsilon i plus epsilon i tilde, right? This is just a discrete over r, sorry, over r. What about the denominator? So you can remark that by balance, the orbit is at least uh, uh, some constant over r spaced. Uh, so we said that all the steps of the uh, our towers are of order. Uh, yeah. Or one over r. So, <coughs> so the way you should think this that all my points that belong to an orbit, they belong to some floors of a tower, and the floors in a tower are all disjoint, and uh, the points cannot be closer than the length of the shortest floor of my partition, and all my partition is balanced, so everything is order over. R. 1 over r. So this implies that x, both xi and yi are greater than some uh, constant i over r. So a lower bound is of the right form. So if I put this in, uh, the denominator becomes uh, i squared over r squared. Okay. So each of them is ah times constant. Okay, the constant I uh, I can take it out. It's a uniform constant depending on balance. <coughs> And now we are done because one R cancels and the other R is, uh, consta is constant times R times the series which I, uh, I'm assuming it's controlled. And this is uh, I'm assumption less than some constant, right? So I get my constant times R bound. That's the idea. So what can I prove? So how can, uh, is it clear? This is really the key idea of cancellations. So comparing ice visit from one side with ice visit with another and hope to have enough control to cancel them. Uh. The orbit is one over R space because you are using balance time. Right? I'm using balance, yes. It's not one over R space. Uh, the lower bound, yes, it's uh, that lower bound, but uh, yeah. But okay, now I'm, I'm, uh, let me tell you, uh, uh, okay, maybe I'll put them here. Let me tell you some special cases. So there are some special cases in which you can prove something quite good about uh, this epsilon i. And now I put this case that you like. So mm, I hope I didn't lie. I'm trying to oversimplify a little bit. I hope I don't <laughs> oversimplify and then say something. Uh, OK, so a special case is uh, if I have a rotation. If my interval exchange, or maybe like T is a rotation. And uh, in this case, I will take as R and K, I can take uh, is the denominator of the convergence. So in this case, if uh, you can prove something very special about yi and uh, xi, uh, maybe you can, I'm just using my notation of ordering from the right and to the left. In this case, you can prove that uh, xi and yi are actually just uh, a shift of each other. So this is something like there is some uh, delta, or I will write delta over r just to understand that it's order one over r. So there is a really strong, uh, kind of symmetry. So xi, yi, if you take your orbit and you flip it, 
what you see is a rigidly shifted copy of the same uh, orbit points. Okay, so it's like the difference between xi and yi is a constant, so everything here is the best it can be. So this is constant over r. And uh, this is indeed, uh, uh, there is a, pa a joint paper, quite old, that I have with uh, Yaakov Sinai uh, from when I was a PhD student. And this you can prove by basically combinatorics of substitution of word combinatorics. You can understand very well the partitions that uh, uh, arise from rotations when you do these Rockland towers. And you can call them symbolically, and there is some coding which is almost palindrome. So when you flip it, it looks like the same and you can prove this very concretely. So without induction, it's just a combinatorial, uh, combinatorics of word kind of problem. And there is another case which I told you where absence of mixing was proven well before, well no, not well before, shortly before my general result. So there is a genus two, uh, genus two case. So if you want this, uh, uh, the per, uh, so it actually corresponds to five intervals, and the permutation is one, two, three, four, five, goes to five, four, three, two, one. And this was done by Sheklov. And in general, you can, if you know what is hyperelliptic uh, Rosy class, this is something which is true for hyperelliptic Rosy classes. And essentially, what Sheklov proves is a stronger form of control than what we have in the general case. So essentially, we also prove something like the difference between these two visits. It's bounded by some uniform, uniform constant over R. So there is, a, it's not a, sh I don't know if it's a shift, but uh, there is a strong bound uh, of discrepancy. And this again, uh, Shiklov proves it combinatorially, but uh, I can say one key word, one can understand everything geometrically in these two cases by uh, hyperelliptic involution. So the hyperelliptic involution on the surface generates a strong, uh, gives you some very strong property about closest visit from the light and closest visit from the left. So you can kind of flip your picture and uh, there's a lot of inner symmetry which helps you. And the other special case, which I also proved before the general case, I think it's actually, so are IETs of bounded type. So let me, uh, I haven't defined it, but it basically means that uh, if you look at this positive balanced acceleration, one way to say that uh, uh, these uh, norms are uniformly bounded above. So it corresponds to, bounded type rotation numbers, where the entries of the continued fraction expansion are bounded. Okay. And for those, this is already more si similar to the general phenomenon. What I would essentially like to prove is that uh, one in this case, you have I, AI will be, okay, maybe I should put an absolute value uh, and, uh, like this, will be bounded by something like a universal constant times I to the gamma. So maybe I should, no, it's okay. And uh, where gamma is some constant between uh, one and two, uh, no, uh, zero and one, yes. So there is a power kind of deviation. <coughs> and you see, this is still good. So this is still good because this is good because if I look at the series of constant i to the gamma over i squared, gamma is less than one, so this is finite, okay? So I can allow for a power form of deviation in i, power less than one. So this is much more representative of the typical case, but unfortunately, if the IT is not bounded type, uh, so maybe I, I do one more thing and then we have a little bit of a break. So I'll tell you just the general case and I will try to explain from which, uh, okay, we'll, we'll have a break now. And the general case, uh, I don't know if I can prove it. Uh, the general case, we will not be able to have a uniform constant. So we will prove something like this. So is xi is some constant which depends on the point and then there will be this power form of deviation. 
But uh, what I can tell you of these constants is that this constant, in some sense, depends on all the history of the entries of the continued fraction expansion. So these constants record the past up to the point where you are. So I will write you some kind of expression. This xi is something like maybe, OK, there is a universal constant. And then let me write it like this. It depends on the entry of the matrices. Sorry. And uh, uh, so we are, we are looking at renormalization time. And uh, so it goes from ni to nr. I hope I'm not writing too small. Am I writing too small? Okay, maybe let me write too bigger. Where ci is less than uh, the series from n that goes from, uh, I will tell you what ni is, to nr of the norm of a. And this goes from ni to nr. So this is the product of the matrices from an i to r. But this depends on some constant times. It's exponentially less relevant. Uh, what else should I say? An r minus an i, I guess. Where, where an i is, uh, uh, is the, uh, so I have the interval 0 xi. Wait a so I'm looking at points from 0 to xi. And I can kind of look at what is the uh, largest, the largest base interval that I can fit. So where the uh, si is the inf of n such that uh, some i and j is contained in 0 xi. So it's kind of something which tells me the size of uh, the interval I need to the order of uh, zero xi, something like this. Okay. Okay. So I think it's a good point to stop. So what I want to stress is that uh, these constants, in some sense, according to where my point is, don't depend only on the last entry. They depend on all the previous entries from the last backward. But what's kind of important is that somehow they, uh, uh, in a in a geometric series fashion. So. Uh, OK, maybe I'll stop here and continue later. And then I'll try to tell you, I, I want to finish telling you a little bit what are the type of Diophantine conditions you need to conclude the proof. And which, why do you get this type of estimate? I will tell you more, more things in a few minutes, OK? So at first, I, I realized there are two a small errata, two a small typos in what I, uh, let me do some small correction that I realized. So first of all, the last thing that I wrote, I think I just noticed now, uh, this index I wrote n r, but it should be n and n. So this is the parameter over which I'm summing. So uh, this sum, uh, this is the product from n i to some n, where n is something between n i and the last, and uh, uh, this thing increases with the with the difference n minus n i. So sorry, correct in your typos. Remove the r index, and then I had this thing in my mind when I was. Writing the proof before, I think I, I conf maybe I made a little bit of confusion when I gave you the sketch that uh, the estimates on the Birkhoff sums are sufficient for verifying the criterion. I think I, uh, the, you have one has to be careful. There are two things which look similar. There is Rn and there is Rnj. So Rn is in the rigidity time, it's the partial rigidity. So it's the iterate on which I come back, the small interval j in my set uh, Yn comes back to the base. And uh, I think I only discussed, when I discussed the difference, I, that's what you want to estimate in the criterion. You want to estimate the difference for time up to Rn, the return time. And what I discussed by doing this mean value and cases is actually the difference for a full height of the tower. So I was discussing Rnj. This is the height of the tower. So Rn is in priori much bigger than Rnj. So there is one extra step which I didn't discuss. And uh, maybe I confused you or myself. So then you need Rn, uh, so need uh, plus need to decompose Rn into Rnj. And uh, in this Rnk, 
H-A. And uh, that's another reason why we will need special times where essentially the NK entry is uh, uh, bounded so that uh, there will be finitely many needed to, okay. Th th there is a little bit an extra step which I maybe uh, uh, skipped, so. Uh, okay, I wanted to correct since it's recorded forever. It's better that it's recorded correctly. And <laughs> okay, so we were. I hope I. C I under this is really key. This argument about uh, arithmetic and cancellation. So this may be the main idea you should carry home about cancellations in the symmetric case. But I want to conclude by saying. So we said you can get some kind of, some form of bounds, but these bounds from arithmetic are quite complicated, so they depend on the point in some way. So I want to do two things to finish this uh, absence of mixing. And uh, I want to convince you why you can prove this type of bounds. And uh, vaguely, I mean, at least I'll give you an idea. And then uh, tell you which type of the Yofantine conditions you need to make everything possible. Okay, so maybe I will start by uh, how to prove to prove something like xi is equal to i over r plus uh, uh, ci times i to the gamma over r. Something that's what we want to prove, right? Ah, plus. Uh, uh, Maybe one way to write it is to write it plus big O CI. Something which is big O of this where the constant is CI. Okay, just not to write epsilon I. It's some, the, oh, the error, I want to estimate it like this with the constant which depends on the point and has that complicated expression. So I want to give you a hint of where the power come from and where this expression come from. So first of all, so you want to look at the interval i i, which goes from zero to x i. So you can revert this uh, spacing estimate into some number of visits estimates. So I can look at the cardinality of visits of my orbit to i i. So when I say visits, I mean visits of the orbit I'm considering. So by definition, how many visits my orbit makes to ii? Ii is the ice distance from the ice point from zero. So this I know how many visits it makes to ii. Huh? I, I minus one, okay. Maybe i, uh, uh, i plus one maybe, okay. <laughs> Zero would be already one. Ah, okay, depends how you count them. If I put a semi open, I think uh, actually uh, i is correct. <laughs> okay, so so this is by definition I'm putting from x zero up to x i, and it contains uh, 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 if I put it closed maybe oh i plus one okay i i plus one <laughs> so sorry um, I got confused myself. So if it's xi, it will contain, uh, uh, for example, x1 contains one point if I take it open. Okay, i, good. <laughs> so i, which is the number of visits, and then I, how many visits do you expect? So uh, this phenomenon of IT is that they have this uh, um, power deviations over Goddick averages. So first of all, how many visits do you expect? We have an orbit of length r, so I expect, uh, the expectation should be r times the length of the interval. This is the main term. But uh, uh, if I look at an IT and I count, this is like ergodic theorem, how many visits I have, r cross i. But then there will be some error, which I expect, uh, which uh, should have a power form of deviation. Uh, something like this. Where, so, you, uh, basically, I want to say, if you, can, you want to prove something like this, and uh, that's what you can expect for IT, that an IT, the number of visits, behave like the ergodic term or the main term, plus an error, which is a power. Maybe I should put something like this. 
And if you have this, essentially, you can uh, divide by r, r, and uh, uh, maybe you will get, you know, you will get to that, uh, 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 sorry, the length of this length is uh, xi, the definition of the interval. So you get that uh, xi is equal i over r uh, plus some error which is of the form uh, r xi to the gamma divided by r. So I'm just rearranging the, you see what I'm doing? I'm uh, bringing the error on the other side and divided by r, okay? And the uh, r over xi, again, it's of order of i. So that's kind of where you get the power form of deviations. So I'm just saying that power f <laughs> this uh, power form of discrepancy from arithmetic comes from power form of deviations for the interval 0 xi. Did I? And uh, uh, so how to prove, to prove, to prove, uh, uh, maybe we call it star again. I keep calling star everything. So this is like red star. So, to, so the statement was that this red star is essentially equivalent to what I want to prove. And to prove red star, you first consider special intervals. Special intervals are my induction intervals. I, uh, uh, I am where m less than an k balance, maybe with a j. So first I consider my special intervals, or maybe with an i, so that we don't use the. So for them, so the cardinality of visits to an interval of this form, you control them by the cocycle, because by definition these are a, M, N, I, J. These are entries of the cocycle. Okay? So those you can estimate by uh, using your cocycle. And uh, the fact that for these intervals you have some power form of deviations is one of the very first results on uh, uh, interval exchange transformations. So, so let's say that. Uh, so A and M I J uh, will have some power form of deviation uh, will be something like, uh, uh, what is it? R times the length plus an error term, which is uh, the power of the main term. This is, was essentially proved uh, uh, by Zorich in in uh, uh, in a paper in the 90s and it's this form called power deviations over godic averages for interval exchange maps and then forney proved it in the context of translation flows so uh, this is essentially power deviation what i actually do i need a little bit more quantitative form of zorich so i need some estimate where this constant somehow depend only on the difference between n and m and then I need, I told you this what I was already yesterday was telling you is some kind of Peron Frobenius argument. So if you have Peron Frobenius and you use this balance times to have a definite amount of uh, shrinking of your cone at every step, then you have like a quantitative control on these deviations. So finitely many steps give you a finite gain in this uh, power, okay? So I need uh, proved by Zorich plus, uh, so uniform version, uniform version that I use both for mixing and absence of mixing of uh, a result proved by Zorich. And then, so this is again step one, and then you approximate. Then I'm going to say approximate uh, I, I, by special intervals. Uh, 
Okay? So yesterday we saw the composition of normal Birkhoff sums into special Birkhoff sums. Now we are doing something in some sense uh, similar but on space. So we have any interval and we approximate it with special intervals. And it's uh, the composition similar to yesterday. So here you will take uh, the largest interval, I don't know, I, this will be this i and i. So the, some i and i will be fully contained here. Maybe only one, maybe more. Maybe there are two of these are, this is the partition and i. Then you will have a reminder. And then you will have, which is maybe of, uh, uh, these are intervals of the base of an i minus one. And then you will kind of, there, there are floors of towers of order. And so you kind of decompose uh, interval into intervals, which are towers of Rosevich induction balance times. And uh, when you combine uh, uh, step one for all these levels, that's where you get so these strange constants. So this is what uh, produces expression for CI. So you know how many intervals of one step uh, of this step you use would be at most a norm of uh, uh, some, OK, it would be some norm of some matrix. It would be most of the norm of Ni. Then the number of steps of the, so here the entries of the matrix will come into play and will produce this uh, complicated looking constant, OK? So but what's important that somehow if my interval is not a special interval, discrepancy from the average number of visits depends on all the level of Rosevich induction which enter in approximating it. So, the, you know, some interval could be worse to distribute it than others, and this could happen because in the past time I was worse, uh, badly distributed. But the influence of the past, it's less and less important. So that's what this geometric is. So if I have a huge matrix a million of time ago, it can spoil equidistribution, but it should really be huge. While a badly distributed uh, matrix uh, shortly ago can spoil a lot easily. So they all affect, but less and less in the past. That's kind of the meaning of this constant. And this is enough for uh, cancellations. Uh, just to, to conclude, what type of diopantine condition do you need to request in order to control uh, these deviations? <coughs> so you remember we have these complicated expressions for the constants which depend on the past. And what I want from this constant is that uh, uh, when I sum over i squared, I get something finite and bounded. You remember? So uh, I'm not telling you how you get this, but I will just tell you uh, the flavor of the Diophantine condition. And then I will conclude for the, and go to, uh, uh, OK. So what is the flavor of the Diophantine condition? So Diophantine condition to, to prove absence of mixing. So my proposition one uh, had an almost every IT. So I want to tell you which almost every I'm talking about uh, are based on the following lemma. For almost every IT, there exists a sequence uh, for every epsilon. Uh, sorry, maybe I should put it before. Uh, oh, no, okay, for every epsilon, uh, there exists a C such that, uh, and there exists a sequence of balance times tending to infinity. I want conditions of this form. Then when I look at the matrix A and K, and uh, go in the past, 
Remember, I'm only using balance steps, but so this is. Uh, uh, I want to say that infinitely many times I see matrices which uh, uh, in the past grow in a controlled fashion, sub exponentially. <coughs> now let's see what I'm saying. So, what is this estimate telling me? Put n is equal to 0. Then you have a constant. So a and k should be bounded. And if I go backward, and k minus 1 and k minus 2, I'm allowed to grow. Because if I impose that everything is bounded, I have a bounded type i t, which have measure 0. But the grow, if I place myself at n k, I'm bounded. And if I look backwards, my matrix grow, but sub-exponentially. So this is something which almost every IT will satisfy. So almost every IT will have bounded moments infinitely often. Not only, almost every IT will have bounded moments where the past looks tame, where the pa past is not too bad. So if you ever saw uh, mm, the theory of circle diffio, for example, uh, Yokos has some condition for uh, linearization of circle diffios, which is like being infinitely often the Yofantine in the past. So there are these are kind of recurrence to a good set for the past style of condition. So you find many moments where the past uh, is good. And this is the kind of flavor of this condition. So this lemma is crucial to produce uh, uh, the good times and to produce, uh, to control this uh, series of constants. So I'm not going to tell you why. But uh, so this lemma actually needs to be applied four or five times. So it actually has to be. Okay, okay, maybe I'm, okay, I'm going ahead of myself. So uh, yesterday I gave you an, an exercise about proving some condition was full measure for the rotation. So tool for the lemma. The so yesterday we used, uh, yesterday, Tuesday, we used avila Guesel and Yokoz and the estimates on the co-cycle by avila Guesel and Yokoz to prove the full measure of the mixing the Yofantine condition. Here you actually use much less you just need, uh, only need log integrability. Only need the, the norm of, uh, I'm calling it like this, uh, the cocycle and the inverse cocycle on the space of IT. Ah, sorry, I said log, but I didn't write log. The integral of the log of this is finite. So this is the condition for Ozeledet's theorem to be applied, right? So this is actually, mm, much uh, older than this is Zorich, and it's really his. Uh, yeah, I should say, and I think Konsevich also had the fundamental role. It's Konsevich, Zorich uh, the studied the Apunov exponents and proved this is what you need for Ozeledet. So this is what you need for Ozeledet, i.e., Ozeledet plus. Uh, so maybe I, I would say some losing, and uh, plus Poincare recurrence. So I, I actually, you really need the invertible Rosevich. So you need to go in the past. And you need to say, for typical IT, if I look at the past cycle, the product grows exponentially, because there are Lyapunov exponents. But the nth matrix in the past grows sub-exponentially. It's like the nth term in the ergodic theorem goes to 0 if you're. OK, you can try to think about this line and try to prove uh, this lemma. And, uh, so for almost every IT, the growth in the past is uh, sub-exponential, but the constant will depend on the IT. Then you want to make the constant uniform, so you do some losing, and then you return to infinitely often, you will return to the set where in the past you are good. And this will give you this estimate. Th I'm talking to some people who maybe know more. Don't, don't worry if you don't. So, but this is as much as I will tell you. And what is good of this log integrability? That uh, it's induce, inducible. So if I accelerate a cycle by looking at return times, it's still log integrable. So if a cycle is log integrable, an induced cycle is log integrable. So you can repeat, <laughs> you can apply this lemma to the acceleration uh, obtained by looking at time and k. 
And I need to actually apply this lemma three or four times in the proof, because every time you decompose time or you decompose space, you need to look at the special times, which are a subset of the previous special times. And I think I told you a lot of uh, what I, I hope you got a flavor. It becomes very technical to kind of do this proof, but uh, the idea that you need quite a fine control to achieve these cancellations, you need quite a fine control of the distribution of your points. And again, you can see that Rosevich matrices play a key role because they allow you to estimate deviations quite uh, well. Okay, I think I'm happy. And uh, uh, what's, uh, what's happened after? Actually, it's kind of funny because what I told you all in all the course so far is already, uh, I would say, almost 10 years old. So. But I told you that a lot more has happened in the past few years. So in the past three, four years. So, so these locally Hamiltonian flows were studied in the 90s. Then there was a big gap in uh, after the original results of Kochergin and uh, Hanin Sinai. And then uh, sh myself, especially Sheklov, and uh, the people had this revival on mixing and mixing properties and weak mixing I didn't tell you but was also proven 10 years ago. But then in the last uh, three, four years, uh, there has been an explosion of uh, new results which were made possible by some, some breakthrough maybe in some, okay, I will tell you, I want to give you a flavor of what's happened recently. So what's beyond? So maybe the nice part will be to have two boards. One what's uh, beyond uh, mixing and one is what's beyond absence of mixing. Okay. Uh, sorry, before I do that, maybe a question which was done yesterday. And uh, maybe we always proved something about almost every IT. But at the beginning, I promised uh, almost every IT. I wanted to tell you every result which we proved for almost every IT produce a full measure set, set of uh, locally Hamiltonian flows. And I think I promised, but I, I didn't do it really nicely, but uh, I told you there is a measure class on the set of locally Hamiltonian, so maybe let me just tell you that, uh, uh, just as a remark. So believe me that full measure set of IT produce full measure set, but with respect to uh, uh, with respect to some period coordinates. So if you have a locally Hamiltonian flow, we, I recall you from the first lecture, it's given by a closed one form eta. So just to finish off, so you can look at the integrals of eta along a base of absolute homology. So I will write something like this. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, these are the period coordinates where gamma 1, uh, gamma n are a base of the homology, uh, relative homology of the surface relative to the fixed points of the flow. And, uh, uh, okay, so this is, the, this gives you a measure class. So the bag measure pulled back by the period coordinates give you uh, a notion of uh, zero measure and full measure. And uh, uh, you can see that all once you prove something for almost every IT, essentially these are uh, like your lengths of the exchanged intervals. They are essentially the invariant measure, transverse invariant measure. And if you want the details, I can refer again to <laughs> David <laughs> wrote everything nicely. To prove this full measure, you just need to find a good base of homology. So you need to do it carefully so that you have a base that sees all minimal components and but it's, uh, okay, so. so we did finish to prove what I promised in the first uh, lecture on the classification of mixing and absence of mixing. Okay, sorry. 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 Yes? You're saying uh, implicitly that the space of all, of all um, locally Hamiltonian, uh, local Hamiltonian it's, it's finite dimensional space. There, there is this, yeah, there are these measures that, yeah, so. 
Yeah, you can use this. Uh, there is, this is what is called sometimes Katok fundamental class or Katok. So you fix first the type of, uh, you have to fix type of zeros and type of, so you have some open set where you fix uh, the two twice the genus. So you fix the genus and you fix the number of centers and the number of se simple settles. And this n will be for fixed number of singularities and type. You have an open set where you have this, uh, uh, it's like a finite dimensional Lebesgue measure. These are your uh, moduli in this uh, open set. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but I'm not saying that, I'm saying that those are what matters for the ergodic properties. So once these moduli are generic, are almost every, uh, then you can find all the typical IT. And this was a question that someone asked me yesterday. And <laughs> Uh, you're right, I didn't tell you how, maybe you asked me, I forgot. Okay, so beyond, uh, so beyond, beyond mixing, what's beyond mixing? So we already said uh, beyond mixing, we have uh, quantitative mixing. So this is, uh, you can make everything that I did today quantitatively. So if you have a locally Hamiltonian flow in this uh, asymmetric, uh, so this is the asymmetric setup, you can actually uh, prove, uh, and you have some two functions, G and H, which are, uh, which are continuous C1 with compact support in S minus the fixed points. So supported outside of the singularities, and David, uh, uh, the paper, I think it's uh, published in last year, right? No, 19? Huh? 17. 17, okay. Uh, so you have some estimates for the decay of correlation. So if you look at uh, the integral of G composed with phi T times uh, H uh, 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 on the surface, so this decay is like a constant uh, divided by log t, the power of gamma, where gamma is some power, oh, correct? Yes. Okay, so this is, not only you can prove mixing, but you, you can see that mixing is actually rather slow. It's like a power of log. And uh, this is not uh, a bad estimate. This is not maybe optimal with terms of constant and power, but this is really the true form of the error term. So you do have mixing for these flows, but everything is happening slowly. Why should there be a log? Because everything relies on stretch, and stretch is logarithmic. So this log is a reminiscent of the log in the stretch. So all the mixing is produced by shearing, and shearing <laughs> is logarithmic. That's where the log comes from. OK, so this is essentially clear. It's a refinement of uh, 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 everything that we've done so far. And you can have multiple mixing. So, uh, so what is multiple mixing? So for every k greater than 2, you can look at uh, uh, the measure of some measurable sets A1 intersected with phi t, uh, let's call it A0, phi t1 of A1 up to phi k, I maybe write minus 1, uh, a k minus 1. So you can look at uh, multiple intersections. For mixing, you have only two sets. Here I take k sets, and I flow them. So you say that uh, uh, k mixing, your flow uh, phi t is k mixing if for every choice of measurable sets, uh, this tends to the product of the measures of the AI. And as Ti minus Tj, grow, as every difference of these times grows to infinity. This is k-mixing. So instead than two sets, you take k sets and you push them uh, together. So, uh, for almost every theorem, for almost every IET, and F with uh, uh, asymmetric log over T, 
the special flow, our locally Hamiltonian flow, is k mixing for every k. This is mixing of all orders or multiple mixing. <coughs> so there is a conjecture by Rocklin that uh, mixing should imply mixing of all orders. But this conjecture is a big conjecture in ergodic theory, which is still open. So when you have a class of flows which is mixing, people try to prove <laughs> that actually in special classes you can prove mixing of all orders. So actually when I proved mixing, I remember the first question that Sinai asked me is, are your flows mixing of all orders? And shortly after I met uh, Touvenot, Jean-Paul Touvenot, who told me, oh, you should prove your flow are mixing of all orders using the Ratner property. And this was many years ago. And at that point, this was not feasible. But recently, there was a breakthrough on the Ratner property, the switchable Ratner property. And uh, this is what made this possible. So this result is a result by uh, uh, Adam Kanigowski, Joanna Kulaga, and myself. And it's still a preprint, but it's a preprint of 16, and it's appearing in the Journal of European jour Gems, Journal of European Mathematical Society, but it's been in press for some time to appear in the backlog. And, uh, but it's uh, uh, for the rotation, I should say that for the, I wish I had space here, for the rotation case, this is was proven by Adam, maybe we write just Kanigowski and uh, Bassam Fayyad, and uh, they introduced this Ratner property, switchable Ratner property, which was the needed breakthrough. So, and uh, this again is based, or maybe I'll say, we'll see how we go. Um, this is again based on shearing and having good shearing estimates. So the way you do it is you prove, uh, okay, maybe I'll say it later. You prove some good, even, yeah. Better shearing estimates than what we did. And they give you this Ratner property. And by abstract ergodic theory, this Ratner property plus mixing automatically give you mixing of all orders. So even though it's not this, you don't prove it directly, but you prove it through shearing. And uh, what's beyond, uh, let's go on the other board. Ah, and maybe I can also mention. Okay, maybe I should, uh, the boards are too small. <laughs> okay, so there is another um, result which is in the spirit of mixing and improving mixing estimates, which concerns the spectrum. So, I, yeah, I don't think I can define the spectrum for you, so uh, maybe I will just say, uh, so, so, for, this is not for the log flows, but what are called Kocherguin flows. So if you take, if you get a result for the rotation, and uh, for powers, we, uh, for a power type of singularity, so function of this form, symmetric power. So uh, 1 over x alpha, 1 minus x to the alpha, and here alpha is actually less than 1, but very close to 1. So it's very close to 1 for some maybe 1,000, I don't know, 1 minus 1,000. And uh, Fayad, uh, Forney, and Adam Kanigowski proved that uh, in this case the special flow has uh, uh, absolutely continuous spectrum. Again, forgive me if you don't know what the spectrum is, but uh, I won't define it for you. Uh, you can ask me later. So this is kind of maybe quite surprising for um, entropy zero dynamical systems. And uh, uh, what do they really do? They actually, everything is based again on quantitative mixing in some sense. So they need to prove uh, let me call this uh, C, G, F, these correlations. So it is based, based on uh, something like this. So for special functions F, which are co-boundaries, 
uh, you want to prove that the self-correlations uh, are in L2. Uh, from 0 to t. Am I writing correctly? Yeah. Uh, uh, OK, so basically what you need to do is to perform a similar mixing argument by shearing and quantify your shearing and prove some quantitative estimates on, uh, on uh, shearing. So again, even if it's not visible, but this is again a, mm, a, mm, a result on shearing and uh, improving uh, estimates on uh, 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 mixing via shearing. And here maybe, uh, here the decay of correlation is actually power, but it's a power which is maybe not in L2. And uh, uh, maybe I should just write, sorry, what did I write? I think I want, let me just write, uh, the correlation function is in L2. Let me write, C F F T belongs to L2 of uh, dt. OK, this is what you need. Well, what kind of singularities of the flow is it that gives rise to these kind of singularities? Ah, yes. So this has a smooth, this is maybe it's interesting to say, it has a smooth flow application. And you basically have a linear flow with a stopping ah. point. And the stopping point, it's a, uh, yeah, I think it's just a, a stopping point. But and then you can prove, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, OK. And uh, okay, and then vice versa. This is a reason. So you can spectral theory is certainly one of the things that people in ergodic theory care about. But so the spectrum of the uh, uh, powers was in this uh, absolutely continuous. Uh, the other resultant spectrum I wanted to mention is about uh, beyond somehow beyond absence of mixing. So all these results, I think of them in the spirit of uh, mixing via shearing improvements. Here, I want to improve the cancellations that we did today. So what can you uh, try to prove beyond absence of mixing? Uh, you can prove uh, uh, singularity of the spectrum. So you can prove, for example, uh, all the results. Again, this is fairly old. Four rotations, again, and function with symmetric log. So this is just a symmetric log. Uh, Shisto Fronchek and Marius Lemanchik, I think it's 2003, proved that for almost every rotation number, the special flow, it's opposite to what we had there, has a singular spectrum. So mixing implies that the spectrum is uh, continuous. So here we have, uh, uh, actually, maybe they can prove more. They can, I should say, uh, countable Lebesgue. No, Lebesgue. Lebesgue spectrum. Lebesgue maximum spectral time. And uh, um, here they, they, on the other hand, you have singular spectrum. And what I wanted to mention uh, of this result is that, uh, so I'm going to take another uh, five to 10 minutes to finish. Huh? I'm taking back the five minutes of the break and the maybe the five minutes at the beginning. So uh, what they are doing here is to uh, study. Uh, so someone asked me, what is rigidity good for and what are? So here, what you need to study, in, you need to find some special times, Rn. They will be Qn for the rotation, where your Birkhoff sums, uh, sorry, and some sets Xn whose Lebesgue measure goes to everything. So not on partial rigidity, but on the full space, you want to prove some bounds of Birkhoff sums. So you want to prove. Uh, so that your Birkhoff sums, you are allowing yourself. Uh, also, I can also allow myself to some centering. So there are some constants going to infinity, constants 
there exists a sequence a n. So find R n and the sequence a n. And these sequence are centralizing constants. So I can allow myself to take my Birkhoff sums, maybe translate them up and down. But uh, uh, the soup on my nice set should be uniformly bounded. So this is a form of what we did today. It's a form of bound on Birkhoff sums, right? So today we proved that the difference between x and y on the set Yn is uh, bounded. OK, here instead of writing the difference between two points, I, put, I put take one point as a reference, and it will give me Yn. And uh, so it's uh, tightness somehow. It's uniform tightness, but not on a partial rigidity, but on the full space or something which is growing to, to be the full space, OK? And they also need a little bit, m they can actually do for singular spectrum. They need another ingredient, which, uh, which is somehow obvious from the logarithmic singularity. So you need some kind of uh, tightness. This is some form of tightness with exponential tails. So what uh, is left out of this set has a mass which is decaying exponentially. And this comes from the long singularities, which are intrinsically there. So apart from some exponential small mass, everything is in a tight part of space. So you will see that this is a refinement of uh, absence of mixing. So we have singular spectrum and continuous spectrum, absolutely continuous spectrum. And this result, we are working currently with uh, Adam and Cisto Franček and uh, uh, also, Chaika gave this in one case a contribution. So we are trying to extend it to IT. So we want to prove that absence of mixing it I showed you today actually improves to a singular spectrum. What is really hard is that I showed you today that constellations need balance times. I, I can prove constellations only using balance times. But for here, it's crucial that you have ri full rigidity. So it's like a double game. You want, you want towers which are balanced for cancellations, but you want <laughs> one big tower or rank one for this control. So it's how do you put them together? So there is one case which I'm quite confident we can do. I, well, maybe I shouldn't write it, but uh, let's say it work in progress. With the uh, Chaika, Franchek. Adam uh, and myself, which is genus 2. Uh, why genus 2 is better? Because I showed you genus 2 has very good constellations which come from hyperellipticity. Those constellations are very strong and they also hold when you have a big tower. I don't prove them with balance, I prove them with geometry. So there we have a way out. And in the general case, we have some idea. There is a trick to put together two things, but we will see whether it will work or not. <laughs> but uh, we have hope now. And the last thing I want to mention, so we mentioned quantitative mixing, mixing of all orders, results on the spectrum. And there is a recent trend which is partially motivated by maybe orthogonality conjecture. So there is a big work in but not, well, maybe it's, uh, uh, I think it's of independent interest in ergodic theory, which is this jointness. So again, uh, I can look at my flow, and I can look at uh, what are called the rescalings. So if I have a transformation, I could look at the powers. If I have a flow, I can look at the flow multiplied by a scalar. So lambda here is a real number. So this is the lambda rescaling. So it's just a rescaling time linearly. Okay? And uh, for certain flows, like for the horo cycle flow, that's under entropy zero flow, if I rescale the horo cycle flow, uh, the geodesic flow intertwines the horo cycle with the rescaling. So in, so in some examples, all the rescalings are conjugated to each other or isomorphic to each other. But what uh, um, I would like to conjecture, I don't know if it's maybe bold, but <laughs> my feeling currently is that among parabolic flows, 
the fact that these the scalings are conjugated, it's kind of a rare phenomenon. You shouldn't expect it, but I would like to try to convince myself that it's more typical in the parabolic uh, flows to prove that these two flows are disjoint. So this symbol orthogonal here means uh, uh, disjoint uh, in the sense of Fustenberg or I suspect very disjoint maybe, but disjoint in the sense of Fustenberg. And uh, this means that there are no common joinings, common non-trivial. And again, forgive me if you are not an ergodic theorist and who works with joinings. I can give you the definition of joining later, but I just want to picture some. Um, so joinings are this uh, measure on the products, which are invariant by the product flow and have the correct marginals. Uh, OK, so this is the notion which was very much introduced by Fustenberg and has powerful applications in ergodic theory, the ergodic theory of joinings. So, so maybe uh, let me say, let me, def this, let me put this uh, is the definition, this jointness of uh, rescalings. Let me say that the flow has the disjointness of rescaling property. Uh, if and only if, maybe for all lambda or maybe for almost every lambda, T is disjoint from T lambda. Okay. And uh, two recent results in these directions are, on one hand, uh, uh, a result by, so Adam, Le Marius Lemanchik, and myself. Uh, we proved in the asymmetric log. Uh, for almost every, ah, sorry, uh, this is for rotations. Everything is for rotations. For almost every rotation number, we have, uh, uh, let me call it, uh, disjointness of rescaling. DR. So this property is true for uh, these are Arnold flows, asymmetric over rotation. For almost every Arnold flow, we have this jointness of powers. And this implies something about the jointness of powers is sometimes used to prove maybe a sort of orthogonality conjecture. So this is a very recent preprint. So it's a preprint of uh, uh, November last year, October last year. And also uh, Adam and maybe I should write Berg and Adam Kanivkowski. They also prove the same result for uh, also for rotations, but for symmetric log. So both symmetric and asymmetric log. Maybe I should write R alpha. Uh, again, for almost every alpha, you have this jointness of the scaling. Uh, so the proofs are very different, though. So their proof for symmetric log is a refinement, it uses something of this flavor. It's about tightness of Birkow sums and exponential tails. So by exploiting the exponential tails of this uh, picture, they prove actually spectral uh, disjointness even. Uh, the proof of uh, uh, myself with uh, Marius and Adam, instead it's in some sense a refinement of uh, the mixing estimates. So. Uh, okay, maybe l allow me the last uh, three, five minutes. And, uh, I want to say, so the last, the last ingredient, so, so in some sense multiple mixing, sorry, mixing of all orders, and uh, this disjointness of rescaling uh, for asymmetric. are both based, are based on some form of quantitative shearing. So they are proved on, they are based on improvements of the shearing uh, mixing estimates we saw in the form of the so-called 
switchable router. Switch. Switchable router. Property. And I will maybe finish with the picture. So we proved that if I take two points, x and y, they shear in this asymmetric case, right? So the, the if I take x and y, they, they, um, yeah, they shear. So what you can do is you can find the weight until this uh, shearing is actually of size one. And uh, say that it took you some time, uh, uh, capital T, to get uh, to shearing one. Then you uh, move one of the orbit, the one which was back, by one, so that you kind of realign these uh, uh, two points. Uh, yeah, so I, this is what I'm being, being a shearing one. I mean, that so this is one ahead. So you flow for one more uh, this, and you realign them. And then, if your flow shears slowly, these points will start shearing again. But it will take you some amount of time before they shear again. So say that I, I look uh, at when they become epsilon sheared. So first I wait until they are one sheared, and then I check for how long they are still epsilon sheared. And turns out that in this uh, slowly shearing, slowly, slowly divergent in these parabolic systems, if it took me a time t, I can still hope to stay epsilon close for a fixed proportion. So kappa will depend on epsilon. But uh, for a given epsilon, for a given epsilon, I can find the kappa and I can find the delta such that if any two points which are delta close, maybe apart a small measure of epsilon measure of my space, uh, after they shear by one, they will stay epsilon close for a positive proportion of the time it took to shear. And this picture will happen infinitely often for large, for infinitely large t. So this is a quantitative form of shearing. So if you can prove it, you have a lot of consequences on joining, uh, joining rigidity. This is a property that Ratner proved. So uh, this property is too much to hope for, for flows with singularities, because sometimes your two points will run into a singularity, and you will completely lose control. But uh, sometimes you can, you're happy if, if you don't see your property in the future, you might be happy if you see it when you flow backward. So if you can allow yourself to either flow forward or flow backward and see a picture like this, you have what is called switchable Ratner. And this is uh, something that can be proven and it's something that we prove, they proved for rotations and we proved for IT. And this property automatically allow you to upgrade from mixing to multiple mixing. And uh, it's also key for the disjointness criterion that we developed. And uh, what do you need to make this quantity uh, effective? You actually need uh, uh, better uh, shearing estimates than what we did. So we essentially need uh, to refine the shearing estimates. And uh, if you are interested, I can tell you more. But uh, you, have, you also need better the Yofantine conditions. So we had some bad sets that we had to throw. And, uh, but uh, for mixing, you were happy to throw these bad sets for arbitrarily large times. But for this type of property, you are allowed at the beginning to throw some part of space. But then once you throw your initial part of space, you kind of need good estimates out of those points for all times. So you need to refine even further the Diophantine condition for mixing and get some new full measure that you have a condition for having this Ratner property. So again, this was very hard, but I thought I, I hope I will give I gave you a picture that there is a lot going on very recently beyond what we saw, but all based on 
uh, this type of control on Birkhoff sums for either for mixing on, and you can now I kind of there are this kind of <laughs> yeah a lot of new research going on and uh, uh, yeah Birkhoff sums and estimate of Birkhoff sums can give you a lot of fine information on spectral properties combined with some new techniques. Okay, so I hope you got a good uh, feeling of this area of research and I thank everybody who was here until the end and everybody who watched this YouTube <laughs> channel <laughs> will watch it in the future and got to the end. <laughs> we <will> deserve a <laughs> clap to the audience, okay? <laughs> okay, thanks. I'm done. Yeah.